thyroid surgery rates have tripled in the last three decades. An estimated 118,000 to 166,000 patients a year undergo a thyroidectomy in the United States for benign or malignant thyroid disease. In most thyroid pathology, surgical treatment is the definitive treatment. The aim of this open classroom is to review the most common complications of thyroid surgery. The three most frequent complications after thyroid surgery are neck hematoma, recurrent laryngeal nerve paralysis, and hypercalcemia due to hypoparathyroidism. Asphactic hematoma. Postoperative bleeding is a feared complication of thyroidectomies. The accumulation of blood in the thyroid cell, which is not easily distensible, can endanger the patient's life. Bleeding below the infrahyoid muscles causes tracheal compression, laryngeal edema, and suffocation. Asphactic hematoma occurs in 0.5-2% of thyroidectomies performed by experienced teams, and it usually takes place shortly after extubation, often related to coughing efforts, vomiting, and agitation. It can appear within the first 6 hours of post-op, 40 to 50% of cases, between 7 to 24 hours, 30 to 40% of cases, and to a lesser extent after the first 24 hours, 10 to 20% of cases. In many cases, the exact source of the 30 to 40% bleeding point is not identified during revisional surgery. There are several risk factors that can increase the risk of developing an asphactic hematoma. These are the ones that appear most frequently in the literature. Male sex, older age, high blood pressure, hypoparathyroidism, toxic multinodular goiter, grave space dough disease, increased surgical time, total thyroidectomy is associated with more risk than lobectomy, associated lymphadenectomy, previous thyroid surgery, suboptimal hemostasis, coagulation disorders or antiplatelet or anticoagulant therapies. What preventive measures should be considered to reduce the risk of asphactic hematoma? Before proceeding with closure, a good check of hemostasis, especially of the vessels of the upper pole at the buried ligament area, at the entrance of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, veins at the lower pole of the gland, and also around tracheal perforating vessels. Another useful measure is eliminating small clots that may be covering low-flow venous bleeding using irrigation or a damp gauze. Asking the anesthesiologist to perform a valsalva maneuver is especially helpful in detecting small veins that may bleed with overexertion and increased blood pressure. In the immediate postoperative period, the patient should be kept in a semi-setting position to reduce venous pressure at the cervical level. Vomiting and postoperative cough should also be minimized with appropriate pharmacological treatment. Using energy devices such as monopolar, bipolar or ultrasonic scalpel has been shown to significantly reduce the risk of bleeding. Finally, it is not clear that placing a drain, which is a widely used option, prevents or protects against asphactic hematomas according to the recent literature. The placement of aspiration drains offers no guarantee against an asphactic hematoma and instead has been shown to increase wound infection rates and hospital stay. If bleeding is detectable through drains, re-intervention is recommended when abundant red blood is obtained, more than 100 milliliters per hour. Any patient who, with or without abundant drainage, experiences difficulty breathing and swelling of the wound should also be re-operated on. It is recommended that anesthesia be performed once the wound is open and the hematoma evacuated, as orotracheal intubation in the midst of an asphyxiation crisis can be difficult due to laryngeal edema caused by difficulty in venous return. The most common complication of thyroid surgery is hyperparathyroidism. The incidence of permanent post-thyroidectomy hyperparathyroidism increases with the magnitude of the intervention. It is exceptional after a lobectomy without previous surgery and is more frequent after total thyroidectomy. Postoperative transitory hypercalcemia is common, its incidence being 19-38% to and can reach an incidence of 50% in bilateral thyroidectomies in some series. Permanent hyperthyroidectomy is rarer, its incidence reaching a maximum of 3%.
Hyperparathyroidism can be classified as biochemical when the parathyroid hormone is higher than 12 picograms per milliliter and presents with hypercalcemia, clinical biochemical plus hypercalcemia symptoms, transitory for less than six months or permanent for more than six months. Risk factors related to the presentation of postoperative hyperparathyroidism are total thyroidectomy, autoimmune diseases, central lymph node lymphadenectomy, as it is more likely to inadvertently remove parathyroid glands, endothoracic goiter, less experienced surgeon, simultaneous thyroidectomy plus parathyroidectomy, a history of previous cervical surgery, a history of gastric bypass or other malabsorptive states, hypermagnesemia and vitamin D deficiency contribute to postoperative hypercalcemia, and patients with such a history should be treated previously in order to avoid postoperative deficits. Permanent hyperparathyroidism may be the result of inadvertent parathyroid excision, devascularization of the parathyroid glands during thyroid dissection, a combination of both or thermal injuries. In thyroid cancer, parathyroid excision affects up to 20% of cases in the lower glands if central lymph node clearance is performed. Two surgical maneuvers are especially relevant to maintain parathyroid function. Identify the superior glands and carefully separate them from the thyroid and avoid thyrothymic ligament mass ligation and inferior thyroid veins. It is recommended to leave a margin of 3 to 5 millimeters in the use of the energy device so as not to injure the glands with thermal injuries. Postoperative hypercalcemia has been related to the number of glands identified during surgery. If 3 to 4 glands are identified, the incidence of hyperparathyroidism is statistically significantly lower 3.2% versus 17% of 0 to 2 glands are identified, p equals 0.002. It is always recommended to identify and preserve at least two parathyroid glands. It is advisable to inspect the excised thyroid gland before referring it for histological study, as one may occasionally notice some parathyroid glands accidentally removed in its surface, or that are in a subcapsular position included in the piece. It should be verified that they are not found in anterior thyroid ectopy, which is common. In case of inadvertent excision or obvious devascularization of a parathyroid gland, autotransplantation should be performed according to the well technique. Multiple fragmentation of approximately 1 cubic millimeter or venocath injection of millimeter fragments suspended in 2 milliliters of solium serum and the ipsilateral sternocleidomastoid muscle. The determination of parathyroid hormone at intervals of 2 to 4 weeks after thyroidectomy makes it possible to follow the recovery of parathyroid function in patients with postoperative hypercalcemia. Persistence of undetectable PTH levels or PTH concentrations below 15 picograms per milliliter parathyroid failure, along with the need to administer calcium and vitamin D orally beyond six months of thyroidectomy, suggests permanent hyperparathyroidism. However, this will not be diagnosed until 12 months after the intervention, as numerous cases of late recovery from parathyroid function have been documented. Prospective studies have shown that hypermagnesemia and previous vitamin D deficiency may contribute to postoperative hypercalcemia and should be ruled out in all patients with postoperative hyperparathyroidism. Another relatively common and much feared complication is the injury to one or both recurrent laryngeal nerves, which are closely associated with the thyroid gland and are the main nerves that control the movement of the vocal cords. The recurrent laryngeal nerve is a mixed motor, sensory and autonomic nerve that innervates all the intrinsic muscles of the larynx, with the exception of the cricrothyroid muscle, which is innervated by the superior laryngeal nerve. Recurrent laryngeal nerve injury incidence is around 8%, recovering at 3 months after surgery in the vast majority of cases. Published rates of recurrent laryngeal nerve paralysis incidence after thyroid surgery vary considerably in the literature. Many authors agree that the true recurrent laryngeal nerve injury rate is not well established. 
The main reason is that not all patients undergo a postoperative laryngeal examination systematically after thyroid surgery. The mechanisms of iatrogenic lesions include mechanical, thermal, and vascular injuries. The symptoms of vocal cord paralysis are notoriously inaccurate and there is often a significant divergence between vocal symptoms and objective functioning of the vocal cords. Thus, we find that many patients with postoperative dysphonia do not have paralysis of the vocal cords. The risk factors related to higher incidence of nerve injury are bilateral thyroidectomy, reinvention, and malignant pathology. Unilateral paralysis of the vocal cords can cause dysphonia, dysphagia, more often for fluids, which may be associated with aspiration and breathing difficulty when performing daily activities. Dysphonia is the most common symptom in unilateral paralysis of the vocal cords. Bilateral paralysis can cause stridor and acute airway obstruction and is a medical emergency that frequently requires tracheostomy. Neck hematoma is a low incidence rate, but it is the most severe complication. Most cases occur within the first 24 hours after surgery. Energy use in the Valsalva maneuver can prevent neck hematomas and help ensure correct hemostasis. Leaving a drain is not shown to prevent neck hematomas. Hyperparathyroidism is the most frequent complication. It can be transitory, in most cases, or permanent. The identification of a minimum of two parathyroid glands during surgery is recommended. Recurrent laryngeal nerve paralysis is less frequent. Bilateral lesions can cause acute airway obstruction. Nerve function can be recovered, especially in unilateral lesions.